Hi everyone, uh, thanks for coming, especially on like kind of the most busy part of the semester to the final lecture of the MSCDP Conversations with Practitioners Lecture Series. Uh, for those of you joining for the first time, Computational Design Practices, an MS program in its second year that introduces students to a range of possibilities for design work at the intersection of architecture, urbanism, and computation. I'm sure everyone's heard this at this point, but uh, my name is Adam Vosberg. I'm the Assistant Director of Computational Design Practices along with Laura Kurgan who is the director of the program. Um, so this lecture series intends and has intended to showcase practitioners who are working with computation on various media and subject matters at a wide variety of scales. We've kind of accidentally been going up in scale with each lecture and are now closing with Lai Olson, who will, among other things, talk about her work with internet measurement data and how it can both reveal and influence the key networks of decision making through which industry policy, standards, organizations, and academic research are inextricably, though sometimes imperceptibly, connected. Lai Yi is an artist, writer, and researcher whose work considers systems and the narratives of their histories. She is the lead data scientist at Measurement Lab, where she studies the evolution of the internet, and a part-time lecturer at the New School, where she teaches critical computation, core lab, systems, and statistics in society. She was a 2019 artist in resident at Movement Research, a year eight member of Newing's Art and Code track in partnership with Rhizome, and was a spring 2020 technology resident at Pioneer Works. Her work has been shown at Tech Zine Fair, Movement Research's Fall Festival, New York Art Book Fair, the Internet Archives Decentralized Web Summit, and Our Networks. She loves the Phoenix Suns and the New York Knicks in that order, and we'll talk to you about basketball anytime. Um, and as usual, we'll have a brief Q&A afterwards, so make sure to take the opportunity to ask some questions or share thoughts about Lai Yi's work. So thanks again for coming, y'all. Um, join me in welcoming Lai Yi Olson. Funny, when you, when you write things like you love the Phoenix Suns, the New York Knicks, you don't imagine someone having to say that out loud. So thank you for, <laughs> thank you for doing that. Um, thank you for being here. I understand it's a, a busier week at school, so I'm really grateful that you're here. As said, my name is Lai Yi Olson. It's like the word Lai and letter E, if that's helpful to you. Um, I'm here today to talk about internet measurement, um, which I have learned a lot about through my work at Measurement Lab, where as said, I'm the lead data scientist, was formerly director, and I'm wanting to kind of just give some insight into the technical and logistical bolts of what internet measurement is. Um, and I'm going to call this like the what section of the talk, but and then also some practical applications relevant to policy, um, internet governance and industry, um, but then also talk through some of the more conceptual, squishy, artistic questions that fall out of this practice for me, things that I sort of think about um, while I'm doing it that are these larger, harder to answer, more nuanced questions that I think are equally as important but are less often asked. Um, but again, to, to start, I'll you know, sort of talk through the, just what even is internet measurement. Um, because the, the talk is titled, how, how tall is the internet? Sort of uh, in reference to a joke that a lot of people make, and uh, admittedly that I also make when I say that I measure the internet for a living, because it, it just sounds like, it sounds like a punchline. It sounds like uh, this like impossible task, like you're measuring, you know, like the wind or God or, you know, the Kardashians or something just sort of like incredible that you can't really wrap your mind around. Um, especially something, you know, because the internet is so big and you, you can't see it. And there's obviously, not, maybe not obviously, but there is a physical component to it. But there's also a lot that, you know, extends beyond the physicality of it and is just sort of surrounding us like this amorphous bubble that we're always within and always intertwined. But again, can't um, really conceptualize the bigness of it or the scale of it. And so when I say I you know, measure the internet, it, does, it's, it almost seems laughable because how, how can you do that? Um, what are even the units of measurement that we could conceive to apply to something as ephemeral and consistently moving and um, big? Um, and what I found is when you start trying to think about measuring the internet or really you know, measuring anything, one of, one of the first questions you have to ask is you know, what is it that you're trying to measure? Um, which I've, I've found actually, and maybe you'll find this in your own work, can really quickly turn into an existential question because you're really asking like, what is a good version of the thing that I'm measuring? Like what is the thing that we want to be able to track the growth of or the health of? Um, and so, you know, 
often, and I'll talk about this more, uh, internet measurement is sort of reduced to this idea of speed and availability, so like how fast is it or how uh, accessible is it, um, and those are interesting, you know, sort of contours and, and uh, metrics to think about, but there's also this open question for me around what is what else is there to be measuring about the internet? What else is there to care about uh, in the infrastructure that we're building? Um, and I think there's, there's basically just more to be thinking about besides is the internet fast and available? Um, and so part of what I you know, want to talk through in the later portions of this talk is like, can we imagine, imagine measuring uh, the internet as a way to imagine what else we want from it, what other futures we want to uh, realize within the infrastructure and, uh, and to um, uh, be able to, to utilize within its structures. Um, another thing about, you know, again, measuring anything is that you're, you know, essentially just choosing a metric to check in on from time to time or a way to sort of standardize the understanding of. So I think the, a good analogy is like, uh, we talk about GDP in relation to the economy or, you know, air quality metrics, but those are also good examples because there are many ways to measure the economy and many ways, ways to measure the uh, quality of the air. Um, but we sort of settle on these specific metrics because they kind of gain a fluency of their own and they sort of gain a momentum of their own. And so um, like uh, speed and availability with internet measurement, um, and uh, that's what we see in other sectors too, where we just sort of grab on to one metric. And so there's this question of like, what else could we be thinking about? Um, but before I go into you know all these larger conceptual questions, like I said, I want to go through kind of the the basics and just have a shared terminology to talk about because again, what is what does it even mean to measure the internet? Um, so uh, this is a, a loose framework um, that I use to try and understand like what is it that's actually happening. The one there's two things I want to say before I start is like there are so many ways to measure the internet. There's 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 endless ways that you can think of. And um, this entire discipline, I think, could you know take an entire course. So I'm giving you a crash one. Um, but there are uh, there is like a, a framework that I think you can think about when thinking about internet measurement to kind of ground it and to be able to think about different measurements in relation to one another. Um, so this framework is essentially that there's almost always a point A and a point B that someone is measuring in the network. And we'll go a little bit more into what I mean by a network, but. Um, essentially, you know, you're measuring from one point to another and maybe back, and then you're almost always um, uh, incorporating some methodology about how you send the data, so how, uh, in what shape, or how much, or at what speed, or uh, in what um, uh, uh, size, and, um, and then also you're almost always collecting a metric along the way. So you're essentially sending data from one point in the network to another and saying, like, I'm going to send it this way and see how it reacts under these conditions, and then you're collecting metrics to understand um, what 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 what's the what the behavior of the network is in those conditions. Um, so where point A and point B are in the network, and how the data is sent, and what metrics are collected along the way, are what I think of as the defining characteristics of a measurement, and are also what distinguishes them from other measurements. So again. There's so many ways to measure the internet, but I think a way to sort of wrap your head around what is actually happening is to think, okay, where's the point A, where's the point B, and what is the methodology that's being used? Um, I kind of use this as an entry point because, um, you know, internet measurement like art, I think, can be really overwhelming, but when I'm looking at an art piece, I just think to myself, okay, what am I seeing? What colors are there? How are they organized? Um, and what is the composition and kind of try and go from there. And so I, I use this like point A, point B, what's the methodology as a way to do that with internet measurement. Um, again, this is a bit like how we measure the economy by measuring GDP or like the price of eggs or the unemployment rate. Like these are completely different measurements, but they're almost always trying to give a sense of how the economy is doing. And these internet measurements are often trying to do the same thing. Like how is the internet doing from this perspective? Um, Digging a little bit deeper, um, just as I mentioned, so uh, well, the uh, point A and point B are always placed within a network, and when we talk about the internet, we're actually talking about a network of networks. So these are, um, when not you or I or myself right now are connecting to the internet, our data is not only being um, sent through the uh, network that we're connecting to, but also to other, uh, to networks that connect the networks to other networks. So it's, again, the internet 
is uh, a network of networks and um, when we're placing, uh, when we're doing internet measurement, we're often placing um, the point A and the point B somewhere within that. So you might be placing it um, closer to the user device, you might be placing it, placing it closer to where uh, networks connect with one another, um, but these are, again, the defining characteristics of a measurement. Um, the hubs that, uh, so ISPG in this situation, or in this diagram, um, the hubs that connect these networks are typically called interconnection points, and they're run by what we call transit providers or internet exchange points. Um, and the act of exchanging traffic at these points um, is often referred to as peering. Um, not the most important thing for you to walk away knowing today, but it's an interesting part of it in terms of there's so much more than um, just us subscribing to Comcast or Spectrum, et cetera. Those, these networks are part of a much larger picture and infrastructure that internet measurement um, is often helping try and break down and trying to sort of segment and understand what's going on on those uh, lower level or smaller segments. Um, the other helpful concept to try and understand uh, internet measurement more thoroughly is um, thinking about uh, the protocols. So uh, to communicate with one another, you know, for example, the sender and receiver, when they're sending data to one another, uh, they use protocols. Um, and so proto some examples of protocols are you know, TCP, which you see in the transport layer here, IP, which you see in the network layer uh, protocols. Um, TCP is thinking about how to get uh, packets there in the right order. IP is thinking about how to get them to the right place. Um, and they all sort of play a role. Um, there's a concept of modularity here where they're sort of depending on one another to do their jobs so they can do theirs. Um, but I think a, a really simple way to think about a protocol is kind of like a script or um, like a, an etiquette almost. I, I, as of this week, started trying to learn French and um, the language app that I'm using is giving me a lot of sort of rules about how you talk to different people, talk to professors, talk to fellow students, and I realized that that's a protocol, like that's a sort of protocol, and I think you can think of these internet protocols as ways for computers to understand how to interact with one another. So internet measurement, going back to this uh, diagram, is utilizing or is trying to understand how these protocols are behaving in different uh, environments when sending data from point A to point B. So sending data through these networks and then um, examining these different protocols and collecting metrics along the way to understand how they're doing. Um, so uh, when we uh, um, so when we ask these types of questions that, or when we start thinking about how to measure the internet, we can we can basically start asking like how how is the internet doing? How is it doing today? How has it been doing over time? And again, you're you're picking up on these um, lower level characteristics of how it's working to see um, you know okay is it doing the thing that I expected to do? Um, how well is it delivering data? How common is it for data to actually get there? Um, if it's not getting there, what are the reasons? Be, are they political? Are they technical? Um, are they something to do with the, with the environment? Um, how consistent is it that the data gets from point A to point B under these conditions? And most of the time, I would say most of the time, people are thinking about how to improve the internet such that if something's not getting from point A to point B the way that we want it to, how can we improve the internet uh, such that that happens more often? Um, and so, as I, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, this can, this can quickly become existential because it gets to this question of um, what does it mean for the internet to be doing well? Is it, is it just that packets get from point A to point B? I think that's often um, how we think of it within the discipline um, and are just, you know, sort of teasing apart these different um, questions around um, or sort of um, micro improvements that we can be making for it to do well according to uh, the idea that, you know, speed and availability are the most important aspects. Um, but, you know, I think there's, there's just these larger questions to be asked of what does it mean for the internet to be doing well? Um, and I, and I, I'll invite you to think about that as we go. Um, but for some, the answer to this question is actually quite simple. So, for example, for internet service providers like Comcast or Spectrum, Time Warner, et cetera, they, they mostly just, for them doing, uh, the internet doing well is just that it runs smoothly, their customers are happy, um, and people continue paying the, the subscription fees. Um, so for them, 
the internet doing well is, is really just a maximization of profit. This is also true in a sense for cloud providers like Google Cloud, AWS, Microsoft, et cetera. They're happy if their content that you know, their clients are wanting to um, have hosted is available. Same thing for uh, what we call content delivery networks or CDNs like Cloudflare or Netflix or you know, uh, companies that run CDNs where they're just really interested in getting you as much content as possible because also ads come with that. Um, and so there's, you know, there's a very simple answer to this question from that perspective of as long as the profit is maximized, um, the, internet, the internet's doing well. And so all of these um, companies that I mentioned are, are doing internet measurement routinely because they're interested in keeping this sort of answer um, answered. They want to know, you know, what are the improvements they can make to continue having the internet in a way that, uh, internet work and run in a way that um, reaches their goals. Um, academic researchers are often always uh, are often also running these measurements, um, but often on a, I would say a smaller scale, and they're often thinking about again these sort of like tight corners of you know you can imagine like um, uh, just like tightening the screws and things that can make these smaller improvements to make the existing system function better. Um, but what's interesting is that you know often these even though all these different groups are measuring the internet and sort of keeping tabs on how it's doing according to the, um, their own interests, uh, they often don't share it. Like there's not much of an incentive to make it public. Um, and there's also um, a lack of often um, uh, a wider perspective outside of the parts of the network that they control. And, um, and same for the academic use case, often you know, researchers will sort of run an experiment either in the real internet or a test bed that emulates an internet, but often on a smaller scale such that um, the, the data is only talking about you know, a particular part of the network, one, one network in the network of networks. Um, and this is the void that Measurement Lab um, was created to fill, this idea of needing to be able to share public data as well, uh, or share internet measurement data publicly as well as um, be able to measure the internet at a larger scale. And again, in the quote, real internet where sort of real packets and real content were being hosted. And so Measurement Lab was founded in 2008 um, in part by Vint Cerf as a way to try and address this idea of like how do we measure uh, something as big as the internet um, in, at, a, at a scale and over a long period of time and in a way that um, could be shared publicly because as we'll talk about there's a lot of public applications, there's a lot of applications in the public interest um, of this kind of data and of this kind of research. So just to continue our shared vocabulary I'll talk a little bit more about how MLAB specifically measures the internet, remembering that there are so many ways. Um, but as I mentioned, there's uh, always a point A and a point B, almost always in internet measurement. And for us, uh, the point A and point B are the user, meaning the you know, user devices like a phone or a tablet or even a router, and then uh, a server within an interconnection center. So going back to the um, vocabulary we introduced before, ISPB in the situation um, is a, a an ISP that's connecting other networks. And so historically, that's where MLAB has placed um, our servers as a way to measure the, what we would consider a, a full path or um, you know, um, the entire way or the entire journey that a packet has to make um, to uh, traverse the internet. Um, as of 2022, we started also adding cloud networks or cloud um, servers in cloud networks as a way to also measure where more and more content is being hosted. Um, but just to give a, you know, a concrete example of what specifically MLAB does, this is how um, we've gone about measuring the internet in terms of where point A and point B are. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, there's also you know, the other defining characteristic of how one measures the internet is uh, the methodology. And so um, on our platform, we're able to host uh, up to 12, but right now we host four uh, different measurement methodologies. And um, the way that those are sort of technically or um, logistically implemented is by hosting um, the server side of the measurement, meaning um, where uh, acting as the thing that gives data. And then um, clients are able to run tests, clients typically meaning like a user device. When they run a test, they run against one of our servers. So they're able to uh, traverse the network through the path that a packet would take through from their device into the interconnection point. Um, and when this happens, when a, when a user runs a test from a client, um, they are then uh, sent to our server, they're shown the results, and then their uh, result is archived in our public database. 
And so over um, 14 years of doing this, we've amassed 6 billion rows of data um, and collect about 4 million per day. So you're probably wondering, where does that data come from or who is running these tests? This is a, a map of um, where our servers are in the world. Um, so one of our tests is called Network Diagnostic Tool, or NDT, and it is integrated into Google Search. So if you Google how fast is my internet or speed test or something similar, um, we're the thing that is um, uh, integrated into uh, that search page. So we get a lot of our data from this integration, again, six billion over the course of 14 years. Um, and uh, when someone runs this test, they're shown um, an upload speed and a download speed. And again, we then archive that result and um, publish it publicly in our database. And um, essentially what it's doing is it's just opening up um, a connection, a TCP connection um, for a single stream to be specific, a TCP connection for um, 10 seconds and is just trying to shove as much data through as possible to make a calculation about how, again, fast or speed the, uh, the connection is. Um, so just breaking this down a little bit further, um, we initially placed servers in the interconnection and um, facilitated tests coming from the client as a way to measure user experience. Um, thinking through the idea that when you're accessing content, you, you're not only staying within your own network. So there are speed tests that also um, measure within the network, but we uh, historically have placed servers outside of it as a way to sort of account for the fact that when you go and fetch content from the internet, you actually have to go into the internet. And so this is a, a, just a differentiating thing um, or detail between um, some speed tests and our speed tests. Um, but through all this work, I've learned, um, oh, sorry, this is, the, this is an example of the data that's being archived in um, BigQuery. So this is actually just a subset of it, but essentially this is um, just a, a JSON blob um, that's giving you information about the, your connection, um, upload or download, depending on which way the test is going, um, when you're testing against one of our servers. Um, so through all this work, I've learned that there's, there's a lot of opinions about um, what speed means and what is uh, what you know how we should be measuring it and if that's even the right term and there's a lot of debates about basically all the details I just shared and if you got someone else up here they would say something different um, and so with the next person the next person there's a lot of different opinions about what um, should be measured and I, I I think you know even though a lot of these conversations get quite technical and quite intricate and um, you know really in the weeds I think. I find that they're also kind of beautiful because they're essentially thinking about like what matters, like what should we be measuring? What is the thing that matters to us about the internet? What is the what are the characteristics that we care about seeing and checking in on and day to day saying, okay, is this thing still working well? What is uh, what should we measure and what behaviors of the internet matter? Um, and so again, even though you know these are um, often really detailed um, conversations, I think the measurements help us to sort of, one, all be looking at the same thing and have a conversation around details that we can all see or, you know, um, understand. And then um, it's kind of like also this like sifting through the noise and trying to understand what are the characteristics that matter and what are the things that, you know, with something like the internet that's, that's continuously evolving and changing over time, uh, what are the things that we want to consistently measure over and over again? And in the case of MLab, publicly and at scale, and, and something um, that can create a sort of baseline for how the internet is changing over time. Um, the internet is, after all, an, an infrastructure, and there's this quote from this um, essay from Adam Rothstein on Rhizome. Um, it's called How to See Infrastructure. And in it, they say, infrastructure's power combined with its lack of visibility is the stuff of our society's physical unconscious. So um, I think there's something about measuring the internet like over and over and over and over again over a long period of time um, that you know, allows the internet to sort of drift out of that societal unconscious and, and become seen. And, and, and when something becomes seen, then you can ask you know, better and more specific questions about it. Um, and ask, you know, what, what is it even doing and is that what we want it to be doing and, and how can it be improved? Um, I often think of internet measurement um, through the, the lens of, or 
through the, um, this image of this piece uh, by Franz Erhard Walter, um, where, you know, I kind of feel like the internet is this thing that's always around us and holding us in this, in this way, in a way that we can't see. And I think of internet measurement as almost being able to see this fabric, like see this, um, you know, without internet measurement or without being able to see the infrastructure or understand the infrastructure, we're sort of held and like tethered by um, this material that we're not really aware of. And I think of internet measurement, sometimes, internet measurement sometimes as a way of being able to visualize this fabric that's tethering us all together and understanding the physicality of it and understanding the way um, that it exists in the world. Um, so with that shared vocabulary, I, I want to talk about just like who's actually using this data, what do they use it for, and um, in this section I'll talk about MLAB data, but I'll also just talk about internet measurement um, or other internet measurement projects and um, the efforts at large. So broadband mapping and the digital divide in the U.S. is something that I, you know, it, this could be a whole semester as well, but I'll, I'll try and keep it shorter. Um, so here is the map of the digital divide according to five different data sources, three of which are crowdsourced like MLabs, and it's including MLabs, um, and two of them federal. One is actually the census data, and one is provided by the FCC. Um, the red areas are, the, are those that are reported to, um, by these data sets to not meet the threshold of the definition of broadband in the U.S., which is 25 download, three upload, again, that sort of um, uh, centering around the metric of speed. Uh, but in any case, the, uh, all of these data sets have a way of measuring speed, have a way of measuring that, um, that threshold, and the redder the area is, the more data sets um, uh, say that that area is not meeting um, that threshold of, of 25.3. Um, so one thing to start is like this, there's many versions of this map. Um, many of them do point to the conclusion that there is a digital divide, meaning that there are some people without access in the US uh, or, or adequate access. Um, but there's, you know, mapping is a very contested uh, project and, and, and definitely not only specific to broadband mapping. There's almost always um, a narrative that a map is trying to communicate. And, um, you know, there's always, you know, an effort to make it as objective as possible. Maybe I shouldn't say always. There's often an effort to make it as objective as possible, um, but it is uh, a difficult thing to do is what I've, was what is all that I've really learned. Um, so this is one map of the digital divide. Um, and as you can see, it's, it's, there's, there's an issue here according to multiple data sets. Um, part of the context here is that broadband or internet in the US is, is not regulated as a utility like water and electricity. It's very much treated as a commercial product um, but that said, the, the federal government and the state governments do have um, an interest and an understanding um, that, especially post-COVID, um, that the internet is a, a vital part of living um, and participating in the economy and the democracy. So they, they have a stated interest in, in improving the state of the digital divide. Um, but their solution to this is, I find to be quite a funny one. So um, to measure internet availability in the US, um, every internet service provider is required um, to, to tell the FCC what level of service they provide and in what area, which essentially means the ISPs are, are grading their own homework. They're just, you know, telling the FCC what's what. So they don't have to provide any measurements. They don't have to provide any evidence of this. They just fill out this form and say, I provide service here. Um, and so again, this is sort of like, you know, a water company is just saying like, it's safe, don't worry about it. Um, and so this is the FCC map of 2011. It, it's changed some, but for the past 10 years remained pretty similar. Um, and there's two, uh, one, so to talk about the map, the uh, oranger <laughs> it is, uh, the more service it purportedly has, but basically everything that's orange um, is what has uh, the available, or has the, the threshold of service that's, um, required by the FCC, and so obviously there's a difference here. Um, and again, you know, maps are, maps are narratives in themselves. And so um, again, this data or this map was formed and developed by just collecting information from the internet service providers themselves and saying, you tell us, you tell us what you serve. Um, one of the intricacies of this form too is that it only requires ISPs to report at the census block level, meaning so if, um, one household, if they could, and it's not due, it's not currently, but if it's they could serve 
um, uh, a household in a census block, which can, you know, is a smaller unit, but can be um, larger uh, and include a good amount of households. If they could serve one household within that area, they can report it as served. So that's, you know, you're getting these like larger swaths that are all, this could, like, this could be, you know, one house. So um, that, is an issue and it um, you know just sort of creates an experience that's quite different from the lived reality the reported reality of a lot of um, people who live in these communities who are saying I don't actually have the access I need and what's interesting to me too is that you know they're not going and saying I don't have 25 3 they're saying I can't do homework I can't work I can't do telehealth and there's these really sort of functional realities to what they're describing that are captured by this threshold of 25-3, but it's often expressed and felt much differently. And so I think that's also something interesting in this work of, you know, we, we center around these metrics so that we can have a common language and a common vocabulary, but there's also often very practical and very visceral ways to express what these metrics are trying to. Um, so, you know, you might also say like, well, yeah, this isn't what's happening, but like, so what? So what if the government is wrong? Um, what, why does that matter? And so in one instance, or one way to answer that is just generally this is considered to be, has been considered to be the single source of truth for the White House and for Congress to understand the depth of the problem. So as a way to understand where they need to invest more, or where they need to um, provide more solutions or you know, provide more regulations. Um, and so if the map isn't showing that there's an issue, there's, there's not so much of a call to action. But also in 2022, the infrastructure, Investment, Infrastructure, and Jobs Act, I think I'm getting that wrong, um, the eyes are confusing, uh, made a historic investment in um, broadband specifically. So this is the first time that an investment this large has been made in the US into broadband infrastructure. So $65 billion was um, uh, allocated within uh, this um, project to be able to invest in to broadband and 42.5 billion of that, um, it was meant for an allocation to the states. And so uh, this map, um, not this one in particular, but the, the map that the FCC has created uh, was what decided where or what, how much money each state got. So it became a very uh, political and um, logistical reality that whatever was depicted in these maps was what decided um, who got how much money, um, and uh, how they were able to invest in their, in their state. And so um, in preparation for this, Congress created the uh, uh, National no, Broadband Data Act, and it uh, mandated the FCC to create better maps. Because over the years, I showed this 2011 one, you can Google it, there were, there were there was a lot of just known, uh, known um, um, unhappiness, discomfort with the map and the way that it was portraying the state of broadband. Many leaders were saying that's just not the case. Uh, many state leaders were saying that's not the case and urging the federal government to do better. So um, that was known. So they tried to um, basically improve this um, through the Broadband Data Act by then making it such that um, ISPs had to report at the address level. So no more of the census block thing. You have to say this household has uh, this service or we provide this service. But the lines are still blurry between whether or not they say I could serve or I currently serve, and it's also still it's still the ISP is grading their own homework. It's still them saying we provide this service. Don't worry about it. And so it still does create this idea or this this narrative that you know there's not that much investment or that there's a there's a perhaps different level of investment needed than what some would argue is necessary. Um, and so, again, you know, I just find all this work um, quite interesting because it really drives home for me how mapping is a narrative, data is a narrative, and you can often, um, you know, use it as a reference, uh, in, as an objective reference to an extent, but also there's always the question of who made this map, where did the data come from, how long are they collecting data for, uh, you know, whose interests are represented in this data, and in this mapping, um, and you know, what is the overall sort of um, uh, narrative that I'm meant to walk away with from looking at this map? So another interesting aspect of this work, um, and this is how MLab folds into it, is that because this map just <laughs> doesn't seem real to a lot of people, they'll often um, take it into their own hands in a sort of um, citizen science way by running speed test campaigns 
within the uh, local communities to say like, okay, let's, um, if that's the data set that we're being given, let's try and make our own. So let's try and get a better sense of how uh, the internet is behaving um, in the areas that we're interested in. And so um, this is a study or a report by Michigan Moonshot in um, Michigan uh, in these two different counties that ran um, a crowdsourced data collection campaign integrating um, MLabs and UT. And essentially um, on the left, the uh, purple areas are served according to the crowdsourced survey and the FCC. And then on the, on the, on the right, it's the blue. So you can see there's, there's discrepancies in sort of the takeaways around what kind of investment is needed um, and how much. Um, they're essentially showing, you know, pretty different versions of broadband availability in these areas. And so um, it, this is an interesting case to me too in terms of like, uh, you know, one, just you know, like uh, local versus federal government in the US and sort of like the tensions that can come out within that, um, within that structure of, you know, the federal government saying like, this is reality and the and on the lower levels of government, there being a, a pushback and a, a sort of exercise in trying to um, uh, depict what their constituents and what their communities are communicating as the reality. And of course, within all of this, mapping and data becomes this tool for people to um, have this conversation. Um, so that is a, a those are all US centric um, examples, but I think um, I should note that the digital divide is very much felt elsewhere. Um, but it's what's interesting to me about that is there's um, very different barriers of uh, fixing these issues in depending on uh, what area you're looking in or what region you're looking in. So um, in the US, you know, by the nature of it being originally a de the internet being originally a, a Defense Department project and the internet being um, kind of, you know, commercialized here first. There's a lot, uh, there's a lot, the, the barriers are different to providing access here than say somewhere in the global south or a country that got connected to the global internet at a different time. And there's a lot um, uh, to be asked around, you know, what of the policies or what of the different um, social structures been to um, prevent digital access in the US versus in other areas. Um, it's just, it's a, my point there being it's not necessarily always um, an apples to apples conversation when you're thinking about digital inclusion globally, there's almost always different barriers and different um, systems to consider um, within, within that conversation. So that's one um, practical application of uh, internet measurement data. The next is a bit different, but um, very much relates to this question of um, how is the internet used and, and for what. So uh, this is, uh, these are graphics from um, a project called the Open Observatory of Network Interference, uh, UNI for short. If you Google them, a pizza company comes up, but it's, it's not that one, it's, it's this one. Um, and they measure, they uh, have a really 10 year project, um, really ongoing project around collecting evidence of internet censorship. So they will, you can download an UNI probe, what they call it a probe on your phone. Um, which is just a mobile app, and run measurements to see if a website is blocked in your uh, region. And um, this is particularly used and useful when um, uh, during elections in, in some countries or during uh, protests or just uh, times where the government doesn't want you accessing certain information depending on the region. Um, so, you know, on the, on the left we have blocked domains in Iran from 2014 to 2017. So these were based off of measurements of people running, that people ran from Iran, seeing um, just what kinds of websites were blocked. Um, and, they, and they do this by, um, it's, I actually, probably too much detail, but just um, they basically uh, uh, show what it happens when you try and reach that website and then try and characterize it as a block or uh, as not a block. And that might seem simple, but it's actually often sometimes unclear what is happening on the network level when you're trying to reach your website. And with all of these, there's this kind of open question of like, was it by accident or was it on, uh, intentional? And that's actually kind of a difficult question to answer when you're just looking at the data. Um, when you pair it with the political context, there's, there's more um, conclusions that you might want to go to, but often um, uh, 
the reason people are looking at it at a network measurement level is to provide more objective evidence of the thing happening. So people are reporting it happening, but if you can actually see it in the internet measurement data, that gives that much more validity to their argument. And so they're trying to capture these websites being blocked on a technical level such that there is that much more evidence uh, that to hold the sensor accountable. Um, there's also, you know, on the, on the right side, this is an example of um, measuring during a specific event. So it's kind of tiny, but they're looking at how often um, these uh, various apps, Facebook Messenger, Telegram, and WhatsApp were available during the course of the 2021 general election. Um, and I won't go too much into that, but just, you know, basically this is the project of um, documenting how often this happens, for how long, and to who, and where. Um, this is a project out of uh, Georgia Tech and previously UC San Diego um, called IOTA, or Internet Outage Detection. This is a graph of um, uh, the signals from the same Uganda election in 2021. Um, and the IOTA project is looking at when the internet is uh, shut down. Um, and so this not meaning, um, you know, just one website is blocked. This is meaning um, there's an entire, uh, you can't, if you log on to any website, it's not going to connect. And so... Um, again, get, gathering evidence such that um, sensors or uh, people who are being censored have that much more evidence to say this is happening. This isn't just something that we're saying. This is, you can see it on a network level. There is evidence um, of this occurrence. And uh, both of these projects really uh, also focus on open data. And so um, this is also where, going back to the, this, the idea that there are a lot of um, people collecting this kind of data, but not many publishing it. By making it open, um, the, the idea is that we're able to all um, see where the data is coming from, see how it's calculated uh, and analyzed and aggregated, and have a common um, shared understanding rather than just being given a number, as with the FCC case, about what is happening in the network and have an um, end-to-end uh, transparency in terms of how this data was produced. Because you can imagine it becoming quite political quite fast, um, if, a num if someone just said, look, the internet is being shut down, I have a graph, but don't ask questions about where I came from. Um, so these, pro these projects really um, make an effort to report and to write and to uh, publish the data around how they're coming to these conclusions um, as a way to sort of um, build a common understanding and trust around the behaviors that they're uh, seeing. Um, so I'm going to pause here for questions. Um, and before I go into my lofty <laughs> conceptual ones, uh, are there anything I can answer in terms of, you know, internet measurement or what we just went over? Any terms I can clarify? Anything like that? Yeah. I love this question. Um, I, I'm curious what others in the room would say. I think I would almost never claim a data set to be better than another because I think it's just a difference in um, perspective, let's say. So I, I often actually do say that the ISP or the 477 data or um, the FCC data is helpful because it's kind of like an expectations versus reality thing. And I think there's something to be said for having that. But in terms of um, better, I think it does, or, Projects like MLab make an attempt to represent the user experience. So I think anything that is really centering that is going to be, um, to, to, to use the word I said I don't like to use, an improvement or you know a little bit better in perspective. But this is where I also would point to that there's just, there's a lot of different ideas about how to measure um, the very floaty, ambiguous concept of speed. There's a lot of different ideas about where the point A and point, should, point B should be. Um, and there's a lot of different, um, ideas about what it means to measure if the internet is working well. And so I think while, yes, MLab would say that we try to do that better and other projects would say the same, there's definitely just an ongoing um, debate that, again, I find quite interesting around what is the right metric. And I think where I've landed is that there's no one right metric, that it's always going to be, in my opinion, um, a sort of uh, um, consortium is the wrong word, but amalgamation of uh, these different metrics because they tell you different things. They're often measuring different things. And so where I've ended up is I'm saying, or I'm, when I'm looking at these data sets that are often um, 
purporting to measure the same thing, speed or throughput, um, but doing it in a really different way. Um, if they're both saying, if they're saying different things, that's information because it can help you understand, okay, so this measurement is measuring um, this part of the network and it's bad, Let's so there might be an issue there, that might be the bottleneck. While this one is um, saying the network is good, so maybe the portion of the network that they measure is doing is doing well. But if they're both measuring, if they're both saying that the internet is struggling, then there's that much more evidence that there is an issue. And so chance, it's a long-winded way to say that I, I would actually say there's no like one better metric than the FCC, but the but the um, use of more data and more open data specifically, I think, can help um, get to a, a more realistic understanding. Yeah. Uh, well, the other thing I would say too is um, the, um, this project and others like it often try and pair the internet measurement data with um, uh, qualitative data, just surveys, and so often are trying to pair it with people that are just saying like, yeah, my internet sucks and like that should be enough. You know, I think there's an interesting um, thing that a lot of data-driven or quanti quantitative assessments do where they're trying to sort of legitimize something that people are just saying and we're just not necessarily um, taking into consideration. Um, and so, yeah, I think there's, a, those are also attempts to answer the question better by just asking the people and just saying, like, what, what would you say about your connection? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How did, um, how did you manage to get the search results saying how fast is the internet to point to your website? That's a great question. I mean, honestly, it predates my time at Measurement Lab, so I'm not entirely sure. But um, I will say that the project is supported by Google, and so I think there um, were likely people within the organization that saw the value in being able to collect this amount of data at scale. Um, but yeah, I, my kind of understanding of it is when we got in there and we stayed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a good question. In the Uganda, mm -hmm. the, the Uganda example, where did that data come from? So, How did you? Yes. Uh, yeah. I know less about IOTA. I know UNI is all active measurements, meaning these are people running tests from their devices or their, um, or their phones or their uh, computers. And so they're running um, measurements to contribute to this data set as a way to sort of um, advocate for their experience. Correct, yeah. That's not part of you, okay. Yeah. So it's people there, it's a local, they're connecting to local people and yes. testing local servers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah, Uni does a lot of, actually the last part, I'm not sure, I'm not sure where the servers are located, but the um, Uni does a lot of really great work with working on the ground digital rights activists, so they'll do like sort of um, preparations and trainings for when a shutdown or when a censorship event occurs to be able to collect this data. So there's people on the ground saying like, this is happening, let's all collect, let's all run these tests so we can collect data about what's happening. Yeah. Right, because the local servers aren't mm -hmm. there anyway, yeah. Um, do you guys collect data on the um, um, like emissions associated with the exchange of data packets? Mm, wait, uh, uh, emissions, is that what you said? Yeah. So, oh, um, no, I think that would be really interesting too. And it's actually interesting. I, I spoke at um, the Internet Engineering Task Force recently and a lot of those uh, audience members were also interested in this. I think it's becoming an ongoing um, awareness that also everything that we're doing is, you know, contributing to the environment in some way. It would be interesting to um, test that. I think one of the ideas around methodologies would just be to gain, to collect metrics around how much energy consumption the servers that we uh, place in these data centers are collecting and are, are using, um, and just getting more in information around what our own contributions to the, to the environment are as well. Because if, if it's going to like multiple centers in the network, like they're all like emitting energy, yeah, right? All yeah, they're energy. Yeah, I know far less about that, but I think that would be a really interesting use of our infrastructure for sure, yeah. No, no, go ahead. Mm. Pretty relevant, thank you. It's also not done, but continue. <laughs> yeah, okay. um, because I was more thinking also now in this parallel of what is public and what is not public, and now more private companies pushing even more to develop. Different I'm sorry, can you use I'm oh, sorry. sorry. Is there now more private companies, just like Starlink, for example, with Tesla, um, pushing to really develop a more privatized internet and more ac privatized access to the internet? 
and I think then in parallel also tendencies with Web3 and like other protocols um, where it's also more about protecting your own data and what your thoughts are and how this could be yeah, embedded into, mm. I think, your research and also in how your research and the data that you analyze really becomes manifested and actually, I guess, working with your clients but working with the federal government to really um, yeah, strategically update the existing infrastructure. Because I think it's interesting how it really reflects yeah, I guess the issues that exist in the built environment with built infrastructure, but also the actual digital infrastructure is mm. equally, equally fragile. Um, yeah, so if yeah. this. Ooh, yeah, I really, there's a lot in this question. That's really good. I think um, what I would say to the first part in terms of like the privatization, I think it's actually interesting or open for, uh, it's open for question around how much one private company can actually change the internet. I think something that's, also that we don't have time to go to in this talk, but what's less understood about the internet is that there's a lot of uh, mutual cooperation between these companies. So they might, you know, sort of battle it out in the, in the news or whatever, but they're um, often participating very much as um, co-conspirators at organizations or at organ um, conferences and meetups like the Internet Engineering Task Force and um, ICANN and IEEE and these different um, consortiums meant to sort of mediate how standards and how uh, networks operate, and so I just to say, like in the in the Starlink example, like they're very active at these types of conferences because they they need. I think that's a really interesting thing about the internet is like it needs the rest of the internet to work. Like it can't, there's only it can't run the entire thing itself, and so there's some level of cooperation that happens in these standards org organizations um, that often just to say is also how internet measurement finds its way too is because they're paying attention to these protocols or these standards that are being um, implemented and, and defining measurements based off of them. But in the terms of, yeah, like how can these, or um, how can also measurement understand the sort of impact if I'm understanding your question correctly? Like, uh, I think one way would just be to measure it. Like we can see, you know, more people testing from Starlink in our data. And so there's a degree to which we can see like how um, over time, you know, more tests have been running from Starlink and these examples of just, um, ways to sort of deduce how prevalent they're becoming or how common they're becoming. Um, but then I also think there's there's uh, ways in which measurement can like, so for example, if Starlink's wanting to change something fundamental about the internet, I don't, I don't know what, but just something, you know, in particular, we could measure what it is they're doing um, in a public way that could sort of uh, provide more um, public visibility around what it is, you know, they're doing. There's a, there's a way that, um, measurement itself is like a flashlight is often a concept that um, I find really compelling of like if a thing could be happening and we, you know, if all the difference is that we just start collecting data about it, it becomes that much more known. Um, and so I think that's one way I could see internet measurement being a part of um, trying to understand what it is that's happening with these new companies. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna go into the last little bit. How am I doing? Um, so, <laughs> these, this, the, the last bit of what I want to just talk through is um, different questions that I, uh, it's like a wish list of questions that I wish more people asked um, and that I myself am very uh, excited and compelled by asking. Um, so in the, in the different situations or the different um, research cases that I laid out, the practical applications of internet measurement data, namely the digital divide and internet censorship. Um, there's always a sort of like um, trying to understand what to do to fix the problem, and that makes sense. And there's you know very real um, um, uh, what am I trying to say? impact to asking that question. Um, but I think it's almost always going to benefit from also asking like how did how did we get here? Like what are the contexts that created the digital divide? What are the contexts that created an ecosystem in which uh, censorship is prevalent? Like what are the different sociopolitical and geographical and economic concerns that created a context in which the digital divide is able to uh, exist the way it is or, you know, um, elections are able to be um, under, happen under the context of censorship. There's always just a bit more to the question, I think, um, than just, you know, what is happening now and what can we do to fix it? And I think it will always benefit from this um, longitudinal historical framework around uh, again, how did we get here? How, we're looking at this data as evidence of what's happening right now, but what led to this data? And what are the things that can't be represented in internet measurement data um, that help explain 
why the data is saying what it is. So I think of internet measurement as you know evidence and sort of an artifact of the present time. But what are the again contexts and systems that led um, to that um, conclusion that's being drawn? And so I've been thinking about this term of infrastructural histories, or um, I'm loosely defining as the evolution of infrastructures told through the context of their political, social, and geographical histories. So placing um, these questions that we have about how the internet is running in this larger timeline and this longer framework around what it is or how it is that that came to be. Um, I think we can also flip this um, and say the political, social, and geographic histories told through the evolu evolution of their infrastructure, basically um, how is infrastructure like the internet, like um, public transportation, et cetera, an artifact of, or sorry, a way to tell um, these different, longer, broader histories. So it can be a lot to say, I'm gonna tell the social history of you know, XYZ country, but looking at their infrastructure can be a lens and an entry point into understanding it as a whole. And so for me, I think this is just a, um, a wish that you know, when we're talking about these really difficult um, problems like you know, closing the digital divide and, and providing access to the internet where it's not, um, being, able to take, being able to answer that question by taking a step back and thinking about how it is we got there. Again, what are the political contexts that led to that? And I have this like sneaking suspicion that often what we'll find is that um, the issues that we're seeing with the internet are perhaps just these um, uh, extensions of these larger political contexts, of these larger political dynamics that are happening. So I don't think uh, the areas that are experiencing the digital divide, I don't think that's the only inequality that they're experiencing. I don't think uh, the regions that are experiencing internet censorship, that's the only form of repression that um, is happening in that region. And I think if we look at the broader context, there's gonna be a lot more information for explaining why the technical stuff we're seeing is happening. Who are the actors that were um, uh, in power You know, when the internet was uh, introduced to the region? Um, who's benefiting from it being there? Who's not maybe benefiting from freedom of expression? What are these larger um, uh, uh, cross currents of power that are happening around the infrastructure and how can that help us answer, again, why it is we're seeing you know, graphs like this one. Um, the other thing that I really grapple with in this work is sort of just assuming that the internet is a net good. I, I will say this is the squishiest um, question that I have. I, I don't really have a conclusion um, about the answer to this question, but I think there's a way, I, what I want to at least call out is that there's often an assumption. So often in the um, digital divide conversations and the and internet freedom ones, by nature of the work, it's this kind of, um, the way that it's talked about, the way that the internet is talked about, is often in this like, well, we gotta get people connected. We just, just like full stop, that's the goal. That's the, that's the thing that we want. In the, you know, even the speed test often um, points to this uh, idea of the internet that as long as it's fast, it's working. And I just, I just, think there's probably more to ask about that. And you know, I, in the program that I teach in at the New School and a lot of New York art circles, there's a lot of people thinking about this in terms of, um, you know, is it good that we're all on our phones all the time? Is it good that we're um, connected to all these platforms and are consistently being extracted for data to perpetuate all these different structures? Like, is that good? <laughs> people are asking these questions, but I think um, this is, uh, my wishes for these uh, two conversations, this internet as a net good and internet as a complicated, squishy thing to be um, in conversation with each other more and to understand um, uh, one another in relation, those questions in relation to one another instead of sort of separate conversations. Because I will say also, there's a, there's a part of me too that recognizes that anyone who's um, questioning whether the internet is a net good probably has pretty good access to the internet. Like they probably have um, a really, you know, <laughs> uh, consistent relationship to uh, being connected. And so what is that? Like, what is um, uh, that political, there's a politics to that in terms of who's thinking about um, being too connected versus not being connected at all. And I think there's a way to have this conversation that's like, you know, on the, I, I, part of my answer to this is that because some people have it, everybody should have it. But I think there's a more nuanced way to think about what is it that we're connecting people to? What is the um, reason that we want to connect people? I think you know, in the digital divide conversations, it's often 
censored as an economic good, people can participate in the economy, in the uh, internet freedom conversations is often you know, framed as though they can participate in a democracy, but there's also all of these other sticky things that come with that, and so how do we talk about that in a way that's not um, binary, how, and you know, it's not that the internet is totally bad and we need to get off of it because we've had too much of it, or uh, we need to get people on it because you know, it has everything that the world can offer. Like, what is, what is a way to have that conversation? Um, the, the last thing I'll say too is that the conversations that often happen about the internet being maybe uh, uh, too much or not something that we consider a net good, they're often proposing alternate solutions, but they're often very limited to the what would I would call the application layer or like things that are centered around like design and um, sort of what apps we use. But I think the, the conversation can go down into the infrastructural layer as well, and people like network operators and people like internet service providers perhaps could start considering these questions as well and it can become a more, I think, you know, well-rounded consideration that we're all thinking about. Um, and this gets in, again, to this question of like, what, what is it for? What do we want to use it for? I think there's an a inherent understanding or an implicit understanding that um, because, we have, because we already have it, we have to make it work better the way it is, but I mean, maybe that's not the case, and I think that's what internet measurement makes me think of, is like we're sort of using these metrics to perpetuate the current reality, but is, is that the reality of the internet that we want? Um, and you know, the squishier artist question is like, I think a lot of what internet measurement can help me, at least, at least me, wrap my head around is like, what shape is the internet? Like, what is the thing that we're building? What is the, the form, if it were to be the fabric tethered around our heads? Like, what um, uh, what shape would it be, what uh, movements would it allow, um, what sort of um, physicalization would it become, like what is a sculpture of the internet even. And I should say, you know, a lot of the internet is um, physical, so I'm talking about the internet as a concept, but, you know, what shape do we want um, the internet to be? And then I think another way to ask it is what shape do we want the internet to facilitate? So if we think about the internet as an architecture, as an infrastructure, you know, uh, the way that public transit um, facilitates uh, how we move around a city, how, you know, many people in this room are more qualified to talk about this than me, but how architecture uh, uh, enables you to move around a space in a specific way. Like, what is the way that we want the internet to allow us to move around and to enable us and to empower us? I think also I, I think about, you know, um, I think IOC talks about this, but this idea that you know we can only advocate for like pure existence like what is it to advocate for an internet that actually provides joy and strength and solidarity and things that are not just existing as it is and existing on the day to day like what is an internet that um, facilitates the interactions that we aspire to versus the ones that um, we'll just sort of live with um, so thank you uh, for considering these questions um, that's my email if you want to reach out but I'm also here <laughs> thank you Great. Thanks so much, Lai. That was really amazing. Um, as always, please, anyone raise your hand with questions. I'll go around and distribute some mics. I'm sure there's kind of a lot of questions after that. If anyone has an immediate opinion on if the internet is good or not. Um, thank you, that was a great talk. Um, I get curiosity on um, what conversations or musings you've heard around, um, you know, thinking about innovations um, in different uh, structures or ways of, um, I don't wanna say distributing the internet, but I guess like, um, Maybe like providing it in a sense that's on like an infrastructural level from you know service providers or even like Star you know Starlink or um, other places like that that are deeper than just the you know than what we can affect in the marketplaces that are provided by you know giants on the West Coast. Um, I think my initial question to almost all of those initiatives is how will they scale and how will they, um, if, there, if the hope is that they'll replace the current infrastructure that we have, how will it do so while um, it still runs? Like, or 
you know, so there's always these ideas that, sound, that work relatively well in a smaller population, so like one or two or even hundreds of thousands of servers, but when you scale them up to uh, the level or the you know, breadth that the, inter the current internet is working, I think they often, that's where they run into issues. So I think there's a lot of really compelling ideas, but the question of how can it scale, I think is always gonna be the hard one, which is not to say we should stop trying, but it's, you know, I think that's the question that most of those initi initiatives eventually have to answer. Like how do you um, build something that's going to work at a scale as large as the one that we have now? But do you, um, do you see or maybe think about how um, initiatives can scale in a different way that are like localized maybe? Like if you think about how, you know, um, in the US we have a central, you know, rail like transit system, but if you look at other countries that have different, um, you know, operators like in Japan where they have, you know, different rail companies or whatnot, like is, is there, um, maybe this is this is too speculative of a question in a sense, but like um, if there are different models that like maybe make sense for different locales and mm -hmm. regions and sections of the world, you know, as like the politics is not equal of how, you know, we can use the internet in a yeah, sense. Yeah, I think that, so yeah, great question. No straightforward answer, <laughs> but I think, um, what it makes me think of is again this question of what is the internet for. So if an internet is just you know to help you communicate um, in a way that is different than just watching seven thousand Netflix videos <laughs> like all day, maybe that's a different internet, and maybe that requires different kinds of resources, and maybe it's um, structured differently. So I think like um, that gets into like maybe we can rethink the structures and the shapes and the um, systems. To your example, like you know the structure of a transportation system would change based on. Uh, how many people you're trying to transport, you know, who, uh, how quickly and all these things. And so um, I think there's an opportunity to, I think that's where it has to start is like, what is it for? And then we can think about what the different shapes can be. But yeah, I, this is a, is a fascinating ongoing question. Yeah, because the, you know, transport is very often still um, a government, government program and hasn't completely been privatized yet. So the internet is, mostly privatized. So I'm, I'm curious about the Twitter crisis, what, mm. you, what you think about that, right? Because for so many people, the internet is synonymous with either Facebook or Twitter, right? So in my world, my small little internet world, um, you know, everyone's disgusted, they're all leaving, um, they're leaving Twitter and you, know, you have to get an invitation to Mastodon and an invitation to Blue Sky and there we all are, you oh, know, yeah. all our little liberal bubbles um, talking to each other about how we hate Elon Musk. But on the other hand, you know, Twitter is a very inexpensive and very powerful tool for political organizing in all parts of the world and that are both safe and dangerous and, you know, all of those things. So we kind of watching, are we really watching Twitter crumble or actually yeah. are we watching it strengthen and running away from, you know, something that's gonna change, yeah. you know, into something with no federal regulation that's even more dangerous. Right. Oh, so many thoughts. Um, yeah, I mean, like, mm, so to the conference, to this slide where I was getting at this, like, what is it to question a thing that you have access to but someone else doesn't? Like, I think that so often, um, you know, again, in, like, New York art circles, people will be like, boo, Twitter, boo, Facebook, and, like, I, you know, I get it. It's to an doing extent, all well and fine, and, yeah, the rest of the world. That's, they're often used as tools for organizing because everything else is blocked, and there, there are, they have enough resources um, to not go down during, um, uh, you know, an overflooding of usage. And so I think there's uh, a complex conversation around like private infrastructure being used as a public space. Like, what is what is that? But then, um, yeah, and like, what is the role of, I remember like, uh, I've now invoked AOC twice, but um, <laughs> when she was questioning Mark Zuckerberg um, in Congress, she was, you know, saying like, so you wouldn't take down hate speech or et cetera. And, I, and while I think that's an interest, like, a, of course, that's a question to ask. Like. I don't necessarily want Mark Zuckerberg being the one to, one to decide what is free speech and what is <laughs> um, not. Like I think there's a, a tricky responsibility to give to private companies in that way. Um, these are all just 
stream of consciousness thoughts. I think another thing that's interesting about Twitter in particular that um, I've meant to look more into, but just like I've noticed that they're less active at these internet um, consortium groups. Like they're not very active in the standards bodies. They're mostly depending on like AWS infrastructure as I understand it. So they're, they're really depending on a lot of infrastructure that's not theirs, whereas Meta um, and Google have really put a lot of money and time, SpaceX have, or yeah, SpaceX have put a lot of money and time into creating um, uh, infrastructure such that they can exist more independently and more sort of on their own. So I don't know how that folds into, you know, whatever um, he's thinking of doing. But I don't know, in terms of the, like, um, what's going to happen, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> and I, I, yeah, I think, um, uh, anyway, I, I think, you know, people like you are so rare in the, in the tech world. And what's so great about your work is that you, you know, all your conclusions you're making are through very, very close work with the actual thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like you can say, oh, you know, Twitter has a different infrastructure than, there's so few people that have that knowledge. So have you written anything? Have you published any articles? Like not, no, so not um, scholarly. <laughs> Is that the word? Academically, that's the word. Um, that might be why I can't think of the word. Um, all these people thinking about public interest technology in the yeah. tech world, and yeah. they can't—they don't even know the definition of the world public as it exists, you know, in our in our field of architecture, yeah. for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think. Um, well, thank you, first of all. But then, um, I I think one aspect to this that I'm interested in is like, I think I'm rare because this knowledge often presents itself as very intimidating and very. Um, opaque and something that is not meant to be understood and is not meant to be um, studied sort of, uh, uh, I don't want to say lightly, but you know, outside of the academy. And so I think I am interested too in like the ways in which this knowledge can be uh, understood and disseminated by just paying attention. Like I think that's also a compelling aspect of um, internet measurement and just data in general is like if you just keep looking <laughs> at the thing, there's often something that's revealed through that act. Um, there, I wrote an essay, not uh, an academic publication, but on the Arena blog about measurement as a form of um, tending, like a, as a way of just continuously checking in on um, whatever structure it is that you care about. Um, and so I think there's something in it for me too, not to resist the academic um, structure, but just to also this way of just like, it just being something that you're interested in and caring about and that being a, a pedagogy in its own way or a discipline in its own way. Yeah, yeah. And, and this is a question for you. Well, this is this was an amazing talk and uh, really relevant and, and and in a way also bringing an agenda of mm -hmm. what questions, what are the right questions at this point to ask about internet. And and this is a question for you. Uh, and and also I think it's connected to your question, Laura, and and your work. Uh, and it's how how do you see the the connection of. Uh, let's say internet measurement and scholarship now. And mm -hmm. you also work on data for, for humanities and the, in, in my opinion, a big part of the capacity to produce history now and history mm -hmm. of, of infrastructures is very much as you explained related to the capacity to measure internet. And I wonder what is your experience with basically the intersection of your work with scholarship and how a scholarship can be empowered through uh, an yeah. understanding of how data operates collectively. I really like this question in terms of, yeah, also how internet measurement can be part of knowledge production, as you said. Um, so I should say, like, this isn't an entire burgeoning, I wouldn't, maybe niche, um, but still active uh, academic discipline and, and community. There's an internet measurement conference, um, there's internet measurement specific tracks at the IETF and at um, conferences like SIGCOM, et cetera. SIGCOM is a computer networking uh, uh, conference. But so there are people thinking about this really deeply um, in, a, in a rigorous research way. I, th um, I think what's interesting is that most of them, though, are asking these, I don't want to call them short-sighted, but very focused questions. They're very focused on a, a, a particular behavior of the network um, at a certain protocol level that's you know, this like tiny, finite um, detail that is absolutely important to ask and study and think about, but it's often, I, th I think that's sort of where this small rant comes from, is this idea of like, but what what is the larger context of that question? And so I see um, a lot of internet measurement research happening, and I think I'm, I'm interested in how that can be expanded 
for knowledge production and be intertwined with other forms of knowledge, um, like history, like soci sociology, et cetera? How can it be um, considered not just a technical and not just a computer science interest, but something that is an artifact of these other disciplines as well? Yeah. I, I have a question kind of then, you know, how does this sort of relate to scholarship? But then I'm also kind of wondering how it relates to advocacy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because I'm totally super interested with the questions like we define whether internet's performing well by how fast it is, right? And it's like a very kind of consumer centric way of looking at things. But at the same time, you know, we are living in a world of digital inequality. Uh, you know, I'm thinking of the, um, I don't know if you saw the markup piece from last year called Dollars to Megabits. Yeah, mm -hmm. really, yeah, they produce a series of maps, yeah. provide a very kind of good argument of kind of digital redlining in a way that a lot of the you know areas which were redlined 50, 40, or whenever they were redlined have carried over into having sort of bad right. broadband. Um, so like within those communities of the M Lab and also kind of internet measurement conferences, it like is there a kind of direct tie into advocacy, and if there is, I don't know, is there like some things in particular that people are interested in? It, yeah. At the same time that it feels kind of weird to say that basically like everyone should just have a better internet service provider is it's like a very consumer-centric way of mm -hmm. looking at it, but I don't know. Yeah, I think, yes, yeah, so just to answer and somewhat directly, like this is an example of what I would say is a, is a form of advocacy, also these projects as well in terms of collecting data that otherwise would go unnoticed or Un, unseen um, about events that are you know being reported but not necessarily taken seriously. Um, so that you know there's a level of advocacy there. I think where it's interesting too is how it intersects with open source uh, culture and histories and communities. So there's an, um, a long-standing argument that all of these systems should be again end-to-end -end open, such that um, the data can be um, it, it can be clear how the data was produced. Um, and I think that's the advocacy level of like finding not only um, or not only enabling communities to collect this data, but to understand how it works and to understand and to maintain it themselves, which then easily lends itself to, or like um, is neighbor to uh, efforts to have community infrastructures where people are, people are maintaining the, their own internet. Um, you see this a lot with tribal communities um, in terms of, um, and their concern tends to be like data sovereignty and, and being able to manage their own infrastructure. Um, and so I think the, the advocacy comes in in like, um, not only do we want to build our own things, but we want to be the ones to see how they're doing. We want to be the ones to say, uh, yes, it's, it, yes, it's good, or no, it's, it's, not, it's not enough. Um, so there's a way in which it ties in with the open source nature by making it, um, theoretically at least, easier for communities to do that kind of data collection on their own, and then also be able to do that maintenance of their own infrastructure on their own. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay, well, Thank you. I think we covered a lot of ground here. Yes. <laughs> Thanks so much, Lai. Thank you. <laughs> and then, yeah, please feel free to reach out. Thank you.